we're going to start because um uh welcome everyone we have four guests today um and i'm not going to, to try and introduce them because i'll let them introduce themselves but they are all currently members of art dot earth uh if you've recently become a member or you're new to uh first friday welcome uh this is a welcome space and we uh try to make it as informal as we can in the context of zoom which isn't always easy but if it's your first visit very much welcome um i'm richard Paval, and i uh this is our last um uh first friday of the year and we will not do one in january so we'll be back first week of february and um for those of you who are local um which is not most of you but for those of you who are local uh, we are talking to our friend startington about starting to host these in person as well as staying online so that uh, everybody gets to uh, experience it in the way that they choose however time is time is moving on so uh, please use the chat uh, to make comments or ask questions um the speakers have a very short period and some of them will not have time for conversation some will um but if you uh, put your questions or your comments in the chat we will save those but they will also may be able to feed them into the conversation um so uh, first person i'm going to welcome uh onto the screen with me is ellie ellie who's a, a first friday stalwart and is joining us as always from our home in cyprus so ellie over to you thank you thank you richard hi everybody um i i'd like to share my screen so that i can at least have the first image up so that i know that i'm home and dry and then um i can give you a brief talk um Um, I yeah. think you can see that, but I need uh, to make it bigger. Yeah, if you met, there you go, Ellie. Hit the present. Okay, button. is that the one? Yeah. There we go. We have you. Okay. Phew, now I feel better. Okay, so um, briefly, uh, I'm going to give um, a, just a, a couple of words about what I what work I'm doing now, but just to say. I won't spend long showing you a few images and then I was hoping that this presentation is an opportunity um, for people not you can put stuff in the chat but it would be good to get feedback or responses on what I'll show you so if I quickly read this um, I collaborate with nature it's a two-way relationship I move freely across several art practices like drawing, making, and photography. And I'm not a photographer, but I take lots of images. I draw birds and bird song, also other creatures. I make abstract work that has come about because of an experience in nature or a creature that I have come across, usually lizards, birds, insects. I use all sorts of mediums to draw onto, like rocks and found objects. I make art with seeds and other natural matter and site-specific work out in the natural environment. I remain open to my surroundings and document with the camera. Images are a rich source of visual food and I manipulate them as if they are art materials. The process of creating a photo composite is not premeditating. I can cut and paste and change things as I go along. The feeling making is similar to drawing. I try to tap into the heartbeat of the natural world through the land and creatures or plants, recognizing natural energy and accepting how it is the same as the energy of creativity. I have been trying to explain or explore what creativity is and how it operates when we make art. 
So this is the first image. I take lots of images and I enjoy them. I had no intention of making photographs, the actual artwork. And first I started by, um, in previous series, using an image of the landscape with an image of my drawing. But now they're evolving into something like this. It's just placing images together, but they seem to work. So if I go on to the next one, this is more or less the same images of the last one, but in smaller sections. As I make sort of ghostly things happen, it seems to create a, an image that starts to be a bit dreamlike. So, and I think in this one, there's actually some English landscapes as well. And I think they're probably from your parts, Richard. When I, when I came down there, I took lots of images on, on as I was coming down on the train. So they're all land. It's all earth. I'll go on to the next one. Now, this is um, another one where, again, I'm overlaying in the sense that each image is giving off its own energy, but they somehow seem to all work together. Um, and it's beginning to not matter whether I put trees in the sky um, or as long as they're working in some way, the energy of each image seems to be automatically, like it's like automatic drawing, uh, going into a place that seems okay because I'm putting it there. Now, this is a recent one of a sky here, just last month. I called it October, or well, the month before, since we're in December. And here I've actually got a half-decent camera now, which is um, digital. And so I've started to use better quality images in the hope that maybe I could have them printed and use them as an artwork. Um, and this was just a fantastic sunset. And again, I've just mixed all the images up together. And the same here. Cyprus sunset, the days are very warm and the sunsets are really dramatic, very, very strong color. Um, and I just, I just draw with the images. And that's the last one. So those are the slides I'm going to show. I can go back and forth, maybe rest on the one in the middle. So it would be useful if maybe responses or what you feel when you see these, um, it would just be nice to know what people might think of seeing these images and calling them, if they were printed, a an artwork. Okay, I, I'm just removing the spotlight from Ellie, but I'm going to leave the images up. Um, uh, and if you'd like to come in, uh, uh, just let's do it free for all, because I can't see everybody. Uh, so if you have a comment or a question, please just open your microphone and uh, ask away. Uh, and while you're thinking about that, I will I'll ask the first question to Ellie. Uh, I thought, I don't know if you showed us this, this work in kind of chronological sequence, Ellie, but I noticed very much that you, um, at the beginning, you seem to be working quite hard to sort of create that, to, to create a horizon or to create a landform. Uh, and as you've gone on, you've become much more experimental. And I just uh, wondered if you... Uh, yeah, how conscious that was, or if it's just something that's emerged while you've been making the work. Yes, it, it's just happened. So if you remember the, the artworks at the beginning, the ones that I, I, I came down uh, to Devon with, they were very specific. Each square had a section. There was a, um, a nature image and then a drawing. And the first ones that I showed were still in that form. It's just that I put nine images together. And then as I went along and I started to 
it's like when you do automatic drawing, you stop looking and drawing, you start to just draw. And I think that's when you open up to that creative flow that you might not have that much control over anymore. And that's what's happening with the, with the, with the latest ones. So it's more experimental um, and more um, automatic, I think is, is, is the word. I don't think as much. I just go for it because I'm, trying to um let it's like when you're drawing and you know that it's going well because you're connected it's the same the same thing mm -hmm. and i think you had a question for the for those of us here about whether how you how you would feel about these in the gallery anybody want to uh come in on that well i i have a show coming up and... so, you are. so they're going to be in the gallery so I, I have lots of other work as well. I've got lots of drawings and um, as this one and the other one, I'm ready to go to professional photographers so that they, I'm sure they'll be able to. I think the latest ones where I'm using a proper camera, they probably will say that that will print up quite well. And I'm hoping that I can include this one and that it won't, it will print up to be a reasonable thing. So I am going to see what the response is going to be in the gallery in January. <laughs> how, how big? Well, I, I haven't decided yet, but they're going to be probably um, around uh, about 30 to 40 each square. Nice, yeah. Anybody else want to come in with a, a thought or a comment for Ellie? Yes, I'm interested in um, how you decide to use monochrome or colour. Um, well, is it intuitive? Okay, it's intuitive because a lot of the photographs, I take them and then I turn them into monochrome because they look much better, so I keep them there. And so when I'm choosing... I'll choose them because they they look good. It's it's all very very intuitive. Uh, uh, Annie, Annie, you had another, you put another question in the chat about uh, about the dreamlike quality. And I was yeah, interested in that too, actually. Yes, uh, th there's a sort of dreamlike quality towards the end where they're they're sort of um, superimposed over each other, more layered, Ellie. And I just wondered whether that you had any interest in memory. Um, well, if I was to be really honest, which I will, I hope my, my time's not running out. I, I've recently, and I'm sure lots of you already know, but I've recently really um, thought it's important to go with the teachings of the present moment. And so in some ways, I'm trying to avoid memory. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think dreamlike, yes, because we dream naturally, it's what happens when we sleep. But I'm trying to avoid memory, I think, at the moment, because of what I'm, you know, experiencing. And I think very much agreeing with enjoying the moment rather than pondering on the memories. Uh, Liz, Liz Nicol. Um... Hi, Liz. Um, Hello. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was very interested in the introduction where you were talking about your relationship to nature. And when you started talking to the photo, talking about your photographs, you didn't quite talk about that. No. So I wondered if you could talk a bit more about the aspect of nature that yes. you're interested in, in the photographs. Thank you. Yes. Well, because I, I because I, 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 I move across so many things. Everybody here tends to know that I do lots of bird drawings. Um, and I do. I, I, I just love birds, but they're around. They're in my surrounding all the time. I, I have half an ear on what the crows are doing. I know what's passing. Um, so that's how I'm in tune with nature, because of the surroundings in which I live. And because I live in a in a big sort of plot I have I have my own animals I have a donkey I'm out there all the time and it, it makes no difference I, I could my I might suddenly go to um 
a plant that's got an insect on and uh, that's it I'm I'm taking photographs it just happens that this work I didn't couldn't include everything because there was too much to talk about and so I concentrated just on this work that seems at the moment to be taking a little bit of precedence because it's what I've been working on that's all but um I I I dry things in my studio I arrange plants i put them back in the field i then take images of them in the field so i do quite quite a a lot and it's all in nature basically thank you thank ali you thank you mate. there there are there are some more things in the uh, chat which we will uh you, you'll be able to read later but thank you very much indeed thank you. and um uh, Annie, I'm going to uh, bring you in uh, you. Uh, now and yeah. um, let you um, go off with it. Thank you. My, do I have, oh, okay. Yeah, you're on. Uh, thank you're you, on. Richard. Thank you. Um, I'll just, oh. Right. Now I had everything up and now it's disappeared for some reason. Uh, that's very strange. We, we haven't seen your screen yet. Uh, you haven't seen my screen? No, you can try, try sharing again. Something's not quite working. I don't quite know why. So I'm going into share screen, Richard. Yeah. And then um, some of my uh, desktop is coming up. Uh, the, okay. So then uh, choose um, choose the one that says desktop. Just click on that one. Doesn't say, it just says video, computer, portion of screen. Uh, com like, yeah, click on computer. Yeah. That's audio. Uh, okay, click on, uh, don't know, um, portion of screen. Let me just see. Uh, Shall I just try anyway? Just try it anyway. Yeah, okay, there you go. I've got something here coming up on. Can everyone see? Oh, we did see. You did something, did something a bit strange there. That doesn't uh, Yeah, right. okay. So uh, can you now take your presentation into play mode? How do I do that? Uh, I don't know because I can't see what, what software you're in. Um, PowerPoint. Okay, so it should be up, up on the top bar. There should be a, a start presentation button bear with us everyone we'll get this we'll sort yes yeah, sorry guys it In the worked minute. perfectly before can you find that button that says present or start presentation no just new presentation oh dear um so i can't see your screen fully right how um, about full screen No. Oh, very odd. Sorry okay. about this, guys. It was perfect before. Yeah, of course it was. Oh, this is in rehearsal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Shall I come out and go in again? Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. So my screen is open. My PowerPoint is open. Yeah. And so, I'm sharing screen. And can you see your PowerPoint there in, as a choice? No, that's what I'm. Oh, I wonder if it's. Oh, here we are. I've got it now. Yeah, now hooray. Good. So now, yeah. if you uh, play from the start, up on the. Keep going now. Keep going up onto play. No, not quite that far. Uh, where it says below. Play from yeah, start. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Well done. All right, guys. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, 
So um, I'm just going to whiz through this, um, but at a, at a speed of knots, everyone. So um, I don't know if you can see um, my text at the side, if you've got time to read that as well, that would be great, but don't worry if you don't. So I'm just going to um, rush through a little bit of background as to my work at the moment, and um, uh, then I'll show you a couple of videos and a last piece of work that I'd really like some feedback on, but I don't know if there's going to be enough time, so I'll leave my email in the chat for you if anyone wants to um, give me any comments. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my practice. And um, my, so my practice is a response to place and thoughts around transformation. And I'm also interested in animism. Um, I see my work as relational and interconnected with ecology and species. And um, I'm exploring how I can integrate empathic responses into my practice and how I can be congruent in my responses as an artist. So um, marrying up the internal and the external. And I've worked with rivers, the sea, water, and more recently, um, I've been working with animals. So um, I'm going to show you um, a very short video of a piece that I did in Stephen's Gardens in London during the lockdown. So it was, a, it was a sort of response to mask wearing and um, I extended the mask to make a beak. And I was sort of really interested in sort of the amount of bird sound that I was hearing during the pandemic. And birds became sort of the focus of my work really. And I, I was sort of really interested in the idea of sort of being caged in and having my wings clipped almost and feeling that I was not able to fly, so imagining being a bird. So I'm going to read something at the same time. I haven't done this before, so you'll have to bear with me, but I just thought I'd read this out loud just for myself and for you um, at the same time. Um, so I'm just going to play this. Hopefully it will play. Oh. Yeah, all is well. Is there any way I could turn it down? Uh, uh, we're not hearing the sound that loud, so I wouldn't worry about it. Sorry? So we're not hearing the sound very much, so I wouldn't worry about oh, okay. it. Okay, all right. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Trick, trap, draw, poor, wrap. Creeping along the skirting board. Crouching mystery, keep looking up, no need to look down. Bird, tree, human, insect, stretch, hook, beak, root, seed, claw, earth, home, tree, gives, flies, safe, air, chewing earth language, small air movements, flapping. Wear feathers on your eyes, nose dive and swarm, cutting through, palms up, reaching out, pointing, crawling, preening, chill clapping, staring bony road drill, dipping and bobbing its head, frantic prayer, cat flies, air plunder, bugs from the soil. Caterpillars with lice, deaths over and over again, chiseled out of the membrane and calcium carbonate, marble egg in the luminescent spring. So I, I, I haven't put those two things together before, but I just wanted to try them out. So any feedback would be great. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm just going to, um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this. So I'm just going to explain it to you, I think. So um, just after I'd done that work, um, I wanted to make a declaration of my intention of commitment to birds. So um, I've, I've created a manifesto, which I'm 
hoping to sort of develop a little bit more, but it's called An Incomplete Manifesto for Birds. So um, I'm hoping to make this into a zine at some point as well. So learn about your lives, build a closer relationship with you and grow in empathy towards you. Put empathic understanding into practice through the action of wearing a mask with a beak and embodying the life of a bird. Reflect on my own position and who we think we are in the world and examine my commitment to the greater good of birds. Live with an intention beyond the self and to seek harmony with you. Trust in your intelligence and your ability to live in harmony with plants, insects, trees and other species. Live without judgment that any one bird species is any more valuable than another species. Explore the mythology surrounding you and commit to understanding your history and other worlds you have inhabited. Be mindful of your songs, listening with care to your voices in the landscape of life. Drive carefully and be mindful of pigeons and pheasants as you are particularly vulnerable to being killed on the road. Accept how you live as part of the world fabric and honour your importance in the cycle of life. Keep you in mind during winter months and offer food to avoid starvation. Trust and learn from you and that you do not take more than you need and practice this in my own life. So that was um, read out um, on um, As If Radio during COP21. Um, so it was a sound piece at that time. So I'll go on to the, la the last piece of work. So I've just come back not very long ago from a residency in Northern Greece um, with um, some other artists, um, colleagues of mine, Ida Larson, and Vicky Virgo. And um, this was very kindly funded by um, an organization called OICA that you might be familiar with. So um, we had a, um, so Zagori is, is on, the, on the border of Albania. So it's very far up in the North. And we stayed in a guest house where the woman who owned it was very, um, very much working with the land and she had sheep and we were eating um, butter and cheese from her sheep. And, and she was also working with, um, with wool. So it was a very beautiful place to be. And um, I got very sort of involved with, sheep, with the idea of sheep. I didn't actually meet any of her sheep. But um, so these are sheep in the UK, but I, I was very sort of entranced by it, by what she was doing. And also I wanted to write, sort of feel like I, I wanted to write a love letter to sheep. So this is as far as I've got with, with this work. And it was really this piece that I wanted more feedback on. So I'll leave you my um, email and please do give any feedback if you'd like to. Um, I'd be really grateful. So I, I'm sort of looking for anyone who might be collaborating or living with sheep, because I'd love to um, get to know them a little bit. So um, and and sort of maybe speak my love letter to them. So if anyone has any knowledge, that would be great as well. So I'll read this out and then I'll, I'll finish. So um, love letter to sheep. Dear Sheep, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for offering what you do without question. I thank you for all of your generosity, your quiet tenacity, your ability to be still, to move in unison and to eat the same food without complaint. Your chorus of voices can be heard from far away, puncturing the landscape. You leap with joy in the spring and gently face the same way when the feeling takes you. To you, dearest sheep who are judged as lacking intelligence, I want you to know you are worthy of respect and kindness. I don't want to speak for you all, but today I will and hope in future to work in full collaboration with you. We sheep are individuals as well. 
We recognize faces of up to 50 people. We react to facial expressions and prefer you to smile at us rather than making an angry face. We know who we are and have particular friends in our flock. And for hundreds of years, we have grazed the lands and work, walked with shepherds on the transhumance paths, keeping the vegetation in check and keeping the paths open for you to walk through. We provide you and you for you to use our wool to weave and spin, meat for your table, skin for you to wash our cars, for your rugs and boots, lanolin for your soap and cosmetics, milk, cheese and butter to keep your bones and teeth healthy. Some of you have even harvested our tent stem cells. We, the sheep, wish to stand in unison with each other. So I was particularly interested in sheep because of the idea of transhumance, which is um, which is still um, used in that area somewhat, although not so much now. So it's uh, it's. Honey, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, transhuman okay. Transhumance is really worth looking up, and seems to be yeah. kind of coming back onto into our consciousness. So it's a lovely place for me to rudely end. Uh, That's fine, but, Richard. Can I just but, leave my email for everyone? Yes, please do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to bring uh, Fio onto the screen. I'm going to say goodbye to Annie. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, and just say hi. Yeah, Fio, welcome to your nettles. So we're dying to hear about your nettles, and I will get off the screen. Right. Well, I'm hoping that. Uh... I'll get what I'm asking the computer for. <laughs> uh, like Ellie, it seems to have disappeared, but I'll try and rediscover it. There we go. We can't see it. You can't see it yet, but you will, hopefully. Are you getting it now? We are, absolutely, yeah. Oh, good. So, yes, um, this is my project about nettles, which I've done as part of um, the Dartington Art School Arts and Ecology uh, Masters. So this is my latest my latest, um, my latest um, module I've done around nettles. So I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. Um, it's called The Sting's The Thing. Most of us are pretty clear now that everything's connected. So here's a story about the connection between plants and humans. Or maybe it's about the current crises all species on the planet are facing. Actually, I'm starting with a chat I had with some nettles, illustrated by drawings, rubbings, etc., that I've made. You brushed my naked leg as I climbed away from the riverbank. I hardly noticed your touch, but there was a little sparkle and a tingle, just a bit, other than human to human. You and I were oldies, connecting as oldies do with the sure knowledge of hard times and time well spent after a long life in which so much has happened. You've seen many pass by, young and old, parents and children in a long, hot summer of dips in the river. Now your stalks are tough, thick and purple. Your leaves are tinged with brown. You've touched many bare legs and reached for young souls. And they try. They want to connect too. They're a bit nervous of your skin, your sting. Their skin is so soft. You've got long, stringy roots. You're difficult and awkward, and you like ground that's been dug up by humans. Some say your flowers give humans a natural high, and I've tasted, but to no effect. Maybe I needed a bigger helping. But you've given me tasty nettle soup with sorrel, nettle pesto with walnuts, and nettle tea for refreshment. Trying them out was fun. I've learnt 
amongst other things, the indigenous humans of Ecuador give hard nettle massage to people who are feeling sluggish. Like this, my slug. And some ants, just for fun. But I digress. Later, my nettle friends, I chatted to your young ones, your fresh-faced zingers, who despite the coming autumn was still full of enthusiasm, bright green and uncomplicated, with a little help from some artificial intelligence in the form of a plant wave, they allowed us to hear some electronic music to delight us humans. That's what young ones do. Now we should get some sound, some nettle sound. That sounds very, very sounds very soft, Annie. For you, for you. Sorry, Richard. It's very soft, did you say? It's very soft. We could barely hear it. We can hear. Yes, I could do. Sorry. Thank you, nettles. Thank you for being so in your face. Every human child has fallen at least once off a log and into your standing crowd, then run roaring and tear stained to mum for cuddles and calamine lotion. One mum I talked to behind your back, sorry, praised your valuable iron and your healing properties. But how do young humans feel about you? They like you, not many. They don't like you, more. But everyone knows you and most are wary. There certainly is a relationship. We bump up against each other. Oh, come on, talking to nettles or any other plant, that way lies madness. But so began my nettle collaboration. I made some interconnecting grids, nettle stems with craft wire nodes. You may notice some cables in here too. Artificial intelligence can play a part. Nettle stems can also be stripped down to provide fibers, which in the past were often woven to make fabric. Unfortunately, they need to be picked in June or July to be fresh enough to try that. Maybe I'll try next year. We humans have been so separated that from the world that we forget we are just a part of it like any other. We in the West at least think nature is outside of ourselves and we outside and superior to it. Western philosophy and science Think Socrates and Plato, Descartes and Newton, many others, which over centuries have been almost exclusively male, have driven us to this separation and cynicism, which incidentally has separated us humans from each other as well. Many women, especially outside of Western industrialized countries, and those indigenous peoples who have escaped genocide, have been getting on with their lives understanding that humans are not superior to other species. They have, of course, been unheeded and unpublished over the centuries. Science is not all bad, but combined with capitalism, it's been blinkered, avoiding the innate understanding of our connection with the rest of the world, breeding superiority and aggression. But things are intertwined. Do our phones connect us? or do they take our attention away from each other and the rest of the world? Does AI detract from our humanity or help us connect in fresh new ways? There are other ways of approaching things. David Abrams suggests, what if thought is not born within the human skull, but is a creativity proper to the body as a whole, arising spontaneously from the slippage between an organism and the folding terrain between our flesh and the flesh of the earth. Well, it's easy to think on reading that, oh, come on. I mean, that is so obviously nonsense. We're brainwashed. We need a new conversation, perhaps with nettles. 
So here I am in the nettles. I wanted to physically connect with them and thought of Tracy Emin's image of her clutching piles of banknotes. I know this is a bit different, but I went out and picked a bundle with their permission. I think they felt quite privileged since they're more usually strimmed. In case you ask, which no doubt you will, the tingling lasted around 24 hours after the photo shoot, not at all unpleasantly. And my last slide is called Don't Look Up, and you've probably seen the film. It's about a great catastrophe about to happen and no one would pay attention. They just wanted to get on with their lives. And that's the end. Lovely. Okay. Um, in, in which case, we do have a little bit of time. Uh, thank you, Fio. And uh, Peony, do you want to um, uh, come in with your uh, question for Fio? Yes. Um, I love the way you started with, I'm going to tell you a story, and you spoke to the nettles as well. I love that. Um, I was interested in the tech you used to actually hear the nettles. What was that? I'm intrigued. It's called a plant wave. Yeah. And, um, you attach it to you attach it to the, the leaves and uh, the vibrations play music. The music is actually um, not what precisely what the nettle provides, but the vibrations create that music through um, instrumentals created by humans. Um, and I'm sorry it didn't come out very loud. It's the uh, best I could do. Uh, I've just suggested in the chat that maybe we can post that bit of video uh, a lot on the web page along with the video of today's session so that people can have a chance to hear it. So yes, you, you can Google Plant Wave and, and find out more about it. Um, I'm not an expert by any means. Thank you. <laughs> I will. I will Google it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, anybody else like to um, uh, come in? I wanted to come in because um, Fio and I are not very far away, but um, I'm not using plant wave. I'm using it's called the sound of the plants or the 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 um, music of the plants, which comes from Damanhur, the New Age community in Italy, and we're improvising about once every two weeks with a different plant each time and with a guitarist and a hang drum player and the sound bowls and creating music in which the plant is part of the sound. And they undoubtedly respond to us in some way and each plant has a different character. So the, the notion of making whatever it is and people don't agree exactly what it is that is actually sounding, you're right, Fio, it's a sort of merger of technology and digitization and the plant and human beings. But it's exciting to think that we can actually play in both senses of the words with the plants. And I found it just, we've been doing it for about, uh, about six months now, and it is exciting to be able to make music with the natural world. So I wanted to thank you, Fiona, for that, for that beautiful presentation. I mean, and I love the merger of the music and the poetry and also the images and so on. And also the notion of that sting as a way of relating to things as well. I mean, it may not be a nice way of doing it, but at least one is in relationship. And that made me think a lot about sting and and how we how human beings sting one another, but nonetheless, it's better than not knowing human beings at all. <laughs> that's, that's a really... Uh, interesting comment, June. Welcome. And uh, 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 it was interesting, uh, Fio, that you talked about the sting lasting uh, about 24 hours. And I'd love to, to just hear you talk a little bit about the physicality of that and what how it how it sort of changed over that or uh, over that period and 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 whether it was sometimes actually quite pleasurable. Yes. Well. I think it's interesting that as an adult, the sting is not as strong 
powerful or painful as it is when you're a child. Or maybe when you're a child, it's partly the shock of it because you don't know it's coming or you don't understand it so well. But um, yes, I, I wasn't completely naked in that photo, but I, <laughs> I was in a public place. So I was wearing as little as possible um, uh, so that I would have the effect of the of the sting when I, as I cuddled that big bunch of nettles. Um, I, I didn't find it unpleasant. It was it was quite tingly, really. And uh, I woke up the next morning, and there was still a bit of tingle going on. And it was uh, it was fine. I was I was a bit nervous about doing it, but hmm. uh, in fact, it was not it was not a, too much of a challenge. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that and uh, 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 as with uh, all of all of the others today uh, if there are more things you'd like to share on the website we'd be happy to add those in but i'm now going to uh, introduce our last i'm not going to introduce but i'm going to invite our last guest uh, sarah thomas to join us on the screen and um i'm going to hand over to you Thank you, Richard, and hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all, meet you all. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm also going to give you a story. Um, I'm finishing off by introducing my new book, which looks like it's come out backwards there. It's called The Raven's Nest. Um, it's an ecological memoir published by Atlantic, which I did as part of a PhD in interdisciplinary studies with creative writing as my practice. Um, so this... We can see it the right way around. So. We can. Okay, great. Um, so I was looking in this text, it, it details a period of my life spent living in Iceland's West Fjords, which is an amazing region of steep-sided mountains dropping into deep fjords and the roads wiggle in and out of the inlets. So your life is inherently serpentine. And often the north, the far north, is thought of as an empty landscape um, but my experience was one of, of exceptionally tight communities and conviviality and also a continue we talk about our connection with nature but there I experienced for the first time a lack of distinction between people and nature it was it was kind of yeah I wouldn't even talk about it as nature so people and place were very continuous and it was an overwhelming experience that changed changed my life changed my perspective and um it's not that i intended ever to write a book um i actually when i lived there i had no i had i wasn't a writer so i i wasn't taking it in as a writer would take it in but i think partly because of that i was so fully immersed that it could then come out very vividly um but i wanted to find a language for this entanglement with the world for this continue continuity and so it was a, an experiment in form. And the raven's nest is uh, of the title. It's partly an actual nest that um, that I encounter in the book, but it's also the way that I structured it. So this is a story that isn't just a human story where the natural world is a backdrop to a human plot. It's it's a story where there are many stories and many threads weaving throughout. And it also follows um, the cycles of light and dark. And so I thought at the end, you know, what is, how do I, how do I lay these things together in this kind of eclectic polyphony that follows these, these cycles? Because in the Arctic, the light and the dark is the giver and the, and the taker of, of life. Um, and so a nest felt like the appropriate shape for something that's many threaded and cyclical and can withstand most importantly can withstand breaking and repair continuous breaking and repair and breaking and repair and still contain life for many years so as a metaphor for the times that we live in and how we might wish to strive for sort of a multi-species dwelling approach the nest seems to be a good a good metaphor and here it is, it's, um, it's a real nest that I managed to get put as the, as the end papers. Um, and it contains bits of bone 
a knife handle, fishing rope, uh, sorry, fishing net. Uh, in fact, contained also a piece of a rake and a TV aerial and all of these rough twigs at the bottom and then this incredibly intimate center. Um, and I just thought that was fascinating that because there aren't many big trees in Iceland for a raven's nest to be woven into and the, the winds get very strong. So the nest has to be heavy enough to, to be able to just sit on a cliff without getting blown apart by the wind. So these, this human detritus was actually useful to the raven. So ravens using human things to make his home. Um, and it's also called the raven's nest because it was it was raven who really made me feel like I was in daily communion with with the natural world because on the first day that I moved into my my little wooden house facing the sea, I heard a tap on the roof and I didn't know what it was. And after, after a couple of days, I figured out that it was a raven. And I was told by the old man from next door that the woman who'd lived in the house for 70 years before I moved in had always fed this raven, had always put out her bones and scraps for the raven on the front stone. And so it was my duty to continue that ritual. And if I forgot, the raven would come and knock on the roof to remind me. Um, so ravens are something that in, in our culture, we sort of, well, corvids in general are attributed to, you know, bad omens and death. Um, but actually I came to see them very differently as um, very kind and curious and irreverent and tricksterish. And perhaps we ought to think of it that the only reason they're associated with death is because they follow the killing that humans do. They were the ones that came on the battlefield to transfigure that death into life. Um, so I, I became very fond of ravens. Um, and raven raven appears throughout. There's, there's several um, motifs that keep appearing. One is raven, one is seal. And... I keep coming back around to them, but from different perspectives, because I feel like there isn't ever just one story that, you know, I approach seal as a wild creature, as food, as an aesthetic moment, as a, something that's being sung to. Um, so I hope that this, this text holds the, the space for these, this multiplicity. Um, and on, on the context of, of weaving, story, the way that I've been taking this around the country, um, it, it actually started also a bit by accident that um, there's a lovely orality to Icelandic speech and to the way that Icelanders relate even what they've done in their day. There's a story, there's a st natural inherent storytelling to the culture. And um, there's a tradition in Iceland called Kvaldvaka, which used to happen on farms in the winter months when it was too dark to do anything outside, but there was still a lot of knitting and mending that needed to be done. And so they would come inside and light a single oil lamp because oil was also scarce. And they would, somebody would read aloud to the household as people did their knitting and, and darning and mending. And I found that to be such an incredibly um, healing thing to do, actually. People, adults have not been read to for a really long time, most adults tell me. And when you immerse yourself for an hour or so in, in a completely different landscape and story, and you're doing, you're darning your socks at the same time, something, something happens. And it feels like the most inherently human thing to do. So I'm going to give you a little taste of that today. And I don't know if you noticed on the on the website invitation for today, you were invited to bring your your crafting projects to do as I read. Um, did anybody bring anything? I'm oh, sorry, I'm I, I somehow missed that bit. It's I mean it's fine. It will it will, <laughs> it will still it will still work. Um, yes. it, it is a lovely it's a lovely opportunity to to do. But I'm. I'm doing these around the country, um, and I will put my web, my website address in the in the chat at the end so that you can follow the events if you want to come to one in person, and also the um, the audio book 
exists and it's narrated by me. So if you wanted to have your own little personal Kvaltvaka at home, that's also possible. So I was um, I was saying to the others earlier that I like to try and choose um, choose a passage that speaks to what we've been speaking about in any given context. But and there were several things I could I could give you a whole chapter about sheep, um, and but just because the last thing I heard was that lovely Abrams quote about folding yourself into the landscape. Um, there's just something about this this part of the book that is calling to me right now. So I'm going to take you to a moment at the sort of early summer, which bearing in mind that, you know, when you have a very long winter full of, that used to be, I should say, snow from October through till May, June is actually the time when the snow is suddenly melted and the ground is very sodden and everything is growing and it's all happening incredibly quickly. That moment going from frost to full life happens within a month. So you don't get the slow unfolding spring of blossoms or anything like that. So this is um, this is when we are just starting to make a garden. And we tried to make a compost heap all winter, but obviously nothing composts in winter because it's sub-zero the whole time. In the absence yet of any compost to enrich the new vegetable patch, Bjartney and I take a spade and a wheelbarrow on an evening walk up the valley where there are horses. We cross the cattle grid to find them there, chewing contentedly on the lush carpet of growth. It is a perfect U-shaped glacial valley. A river snakes the valley bottom, peaty dark and glinting in the sun. Hay meadows flank the river, which is eternally replenished by snowmelt from the mountains soaring above. Good evening, you fine, fine horses, Gardney coos at them. May we take some of your shit? It beguiles me how he talks to animals, children and older people alike. Those are the beings with whom he is most comfortable, to whom he relates. The mares gather around us, curious. They sniff and flick their manes, their chest muscles twitching. I feel the warm air from one horse's nostrils on my open palm, beneficent in the cool of evening. The green bowl of the valley is curved into each of their liquid black eyes. Tentatively, we begin to scoop some of the snow-flattened manure out of the grass, and they do not object. I don't know how much it is rotted, but at least we know it is from last summer. We pile the manure high and wheel the barrow back home. Know what this is called? Gaffney asks, pointing at the wheelbarrow. Mm, Skeeterhjob, I suggest. Gaffney bends over laughing. A shit wheel. Nice one, my love. I like your thinking. Gartney, his mother, and her siblings love word games. They're greatly amused when I invent new words for things I have not yet learned. Sometimes they adopt my word as a family in-joke. I enjoy that. It makes me feel accepted, allowed into their language on my own terms. They know that I am making my own map. Mine is no different from their ancestors' process of creating a vocabulary for new inventions and concepts from pre-existing words and imaginaries. Like wellies, stegrail, stepping machines, or computer, tova, number oracle, or dongle, pungur, scrotum, or sack. It's Hjolburu. Gardni corrects me. Hjol, burr, same as wheel, barrow. But I think I like ship wheel better. Broken down, I see how so many of these words are the same as my own, or they follow the shape of how I might name something if I was left to describe the world in my own way. Words say much about the way we think, so learning a language is also learning a way to think. This way, 
This Icelandic way stirs something old in me. It returns me to a place before, a place of beginning again, which is more like home than anything else I have felt. When I notice the sound of a known word in an unknown word, I can make camp in that familiar place and explore new routes from there, get to know what it is hitched onto this time. Little by little, I make my world anew. I point, I ask, I am told, and I begin to see how it relates to my language, to its function, to other parts of the world, to a history we share. The first words I learned were the names of wildflowers and herbs as Bjartni and I made our first road trip in Mariobjatla, our camper van, in June 2009, at a time of year when the flowers sing loudly for two weeks and the leaves are most potent. I painted some on the inside of the van door with their names, Geldinger Napur, Kloefting, Hollert. So they would be the last thing I saw when I fell asleep and the first when I woke up. Gida has always given me Icelandic herb tea at Christmas, a mix of leaves she has picked that sprout from the hillsides in early summer. She has shown me the plants and told me their names. This year, I want to gather my own herbs in my valley and give some back to her. I call Gida. Hi, hi. I'm wondering if it's still okay to gather herbs for the tea. It's better in early June, before they've begun to flower. The taste is strong in the leaves then, but just try it. You remember what you're picking? I don't think of the plants in English. I got to know them here. What I see in my mind's eye when she asks the question is their shape, their colour and the sound of their name. Leon's lappi, lion's feet. Rübnerloif, ptarmigan leaf. Blothberg, blood of the rock. Only later would these shapes and images become hitched onto Alpine Lady's Mantle, Mountain Dryas and Wild Thyme when I had read about them in books. That's right. But Sarah, she interrupts unusually. Yes? What's happened? Do you know you're speaking to me in Icelandic in full sentences? An invisible moment has arrived in which these words I have been gathering like herbs have infused. There are enough words in me now to improvise a world, to express and to be understood. I have been speaking Icelandic and so has she. Maybe it was being away, I say. It allowed the words to settle. A mutual joy fills the distance down the telephone line and brings us closer. We can communicate. I walk out the door with this newfound freedom and power to gather herbs in my valley. Here, walking among the flowers and the fundamentals, I am allowed and able to have a relationship with this place. Through words, through imagination, through living and tending, I can go back to a beginning, not the beginning. There is no beginning and there is no end, but a beginning nonetheless. One in which my thoughts are not yet housed. One in which they make a home for themselves and take their cue from the place they are in. Lovely, beautiful. That was a beautiful, and he said at the beginning, she would want to go last so she could choose something that felt sympathetic to uh, the, the, the what had gone before, which you did beautifully. Uh, and that's a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much. We will make sure, everybody, that various links and things that we've talked about today are uh, included on the website. The video of today's session should be up uh monday or tuesday at the latest and uh, it's been great to uh have you all with us today um and it just remains to say goodbye and we will not be back in january we will be back in february 
So the first Friday of February. So all have a, a wonderful festive time, festive season, and a happy new year. Uh, and we'll see you in February. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Love you.